Once upon a time in the United States, people believed that they had a society. And they believed that we should construct the rules where essentially the refs don't work for one team or the other. That uh, ethic, that sensibility, certainly has come into, uh, how you say, come to be tested at various times in our history, but probably never more fiercely and visibly as in 2007 and 8. Uh, many people now attribute the discord that manifests as Occupy Wall Street on the left or the Tea Party on the right. It's not just related to the financial sector, but as a deterioration in the faith, legitimacy, and trust in American governance altogether. That loss of faith, if it be true, puts America at a huge disadvantage in terms of its ability to evolve and transform. I think it's interesting to be here at Scandinavia House because the last time I had breakfast here was with a group of people from Sweden who said to me, the American model of fierce deregulation was always said to be the growth model. But now we in Sweden don't fear the robots anymore because we know how to make transformations where our children retain their education, their health care. We retain our pensions, maternity and paternity leave, and job retraining. So we're happy to embrace new productivity. And we see America getting bogged down in despondency, whether related to globalization or related to technology. So I think before us now, we have a tremendous number of challenges. And we are, I say, uh, burdened with the need to regenerate faith and trust in our social systems. So we go back to that, what you might call that, that deep wound of 2008. And the gentlemen here with me are all, how you say, more than experts in this realm. Starting down at the end, the moderator today, Dennis Kelleher, who worked with Senator Dorgan in the leadership office during the Dodd-Frank legislation, and in recent years runs an extraordinary organization called Better Markets. I'd encourage you to read Stephen Brill's new book, because Dennis is uh, featured as one of the good guys who's trying to turn things around. Tom Honig, you've always been trying to turn things around <laughs> in a good direction, whether at the Kansas City Fed or more recently at the FDIC. And I know you've had some uh, serious commentary on Michael Greenberger's work and uh, how I say, a, a new glass Steagall and things of the sort. Michael, our speaker, formerly uh, a commissioner at the CFTC and been a good friend of mine. We worked very closely through all of the uh, Dodd-Frank work when I was uh, at the Roosevelt Institute uh, in their global finance project. And last and certainly not least, we have Chairman Paul Volcker, who uh, I thought weighed in tremendously to the point where, uh, how would I put it? Even the industry started to attack you. <laughs> <laughs> and as INET founder Star. George Soros says, sometimes you got to be happy who your enemies are. So, Chairman Volcker, I'm, uh, I'm really grateful that you made it to see us and, and uh, continue the energy. And I know uh, the Volcker Alliance we've worked with at INET on a numerous occasions is doing excellent work. And I encourage you all to uh, stay tuned to what they have been and, and continue to develop not just in the financial sector, but related to good governance everywhere. So with that, let me turn it over to Dennis and uh, carry, for, carry it from here. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. And thanks, Rob. And thanks to INET, not just for kind of generically everything that they do, but for their steadfast commitment to paying attention to issues, no matter how complex, if they're important. And what we're doing here and talking about really one of the most important things in financial reform in the financial sector, which is derivatives and the cross-border implications of derivatives. Now, it's not going to make a headline, and it doesn't fit in a tweet, but it's a heck of a lot more important. And Michael's going to go through his paper, but I wanted to say to start, first of all, you know, deriv the, the crash, as everybody here knows, had a lot of different causes. Um, but nobody can deny that derivatives were at the core of causing the crash. Derivatives were time bombs laid throughout the financial system, and at the same time, they were a conveyor belt that delivered those time bombs throughout the global financial system. And what this paper really is about is how that happened in 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, 
boom, the time bombs explode throughout the world. The conveyor belt worked, unfortunately. And essentially, this paper talks about how that conveyor belt has been rebuilt by subterfuge, by an industry committed to evading the most sensible, modest, and fundamental and necessary protections. And so Michael, who um, you should, it's, a, it's not that long of a paper. It's 100 pages. And I'd encourage you to read it, because it gives you the broad sweep. It puts it in context. It's actually said in English. You can actually understand it, even <laughs> if you're not a derivatives professional, which most people are not, thank God, right? So with that, um, really one of the nation's most experienced, knowledgeable, and articulate um, experts on the CFTC derivatives and the cross-border implications, uh, Michael's going to run us through the highlights of the paper, and then we're going to have a discussion about it. Okay. It's OK. I'm going to use the podium. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as Rob said, Rob, Tom Ferguson, who was my editor and prodder through this entire thing. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. Uh, we, we started working together right after the meltdown. Uh, saw each, I'm in DC, Rob was in New York. Tom, at that point, was in Boston. But we saw each other a lot. Uh, Tom, Rob, INET have done wonderful work, and I'm indebted to them. They funded this paper. Uh, Dennis is one of the top. Uh, market advocates for the good guys and better markets has just done a fabulous job. I'm honored to have Mr. Volker and Mr. Honig here today to comment on the paper. Uh, when I walked in, somebody was thumbing through the paper and said, this is over 100 pages. <laughs> Actually, it's 110 pages. <laughs> All I would like to say in preface is I worked very hard on a 10-page introduction and summary <laughs> that tells you really everything I think you need to know and cross-references back to the substantive discussion in the paper. Uh, we also have a blog up. There's an abstract. But um, uh, it is a complicated subject made more complicated by the attempt to dodge the regulatory scheme that was put in place by Dodd-Frank. Let me just start, and by the way, I'm going to go pretty fast. Uh, I've only got a limited amount of time, but I'll be here. I'm happy to talk to anybody at length today or in the future. You can find me at the, I'm at the University of Maryland School of Law. You can find me on the website. OK, so it's part of the popular culture now, thanks to uh, Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short, and recently, thanks to the Pope, who has warned <laughs> about the dangers of derivatives, Re recently, the dangers of derivatives and especially credit default swaps. So if you've read The Big Short or seen the movie, I haven't seen the movie because uh, it's a male, uh, bus, busman's holiday. Um, the, the essential thesis of Lewis's book, which is done outside of any legal context, but lays out the problem, is that uh, uh, the big shorters were desperate. To, they, they knew uh, in 2005, 2006 that the market, mortgage market would fail. And they wanted to be able to short the market. And with the help of Goldman Sachs and some others, uh, they got uh, permission from the International Swaps Derivatives Association to, to buy and create what, are, what were called uh, naked credit default swaps. What are those? Uh, credit default swaps are essentially insurance on an investment that you have an interest in. They don't want to call it insurance because insurance is regulated by the states. Uh, so originally, some insurance companies wrote insurance contracts, and the bank said, no, no, you can't do that. We'd be regulated by the states. But essentially, uh, they wanted to select tranches of mortgages that they did not own and bet that those mortgages would fail. How did they do that? They entered into a swap agreement with those that were foolish enough in 2006, 2007 to be giving insurance on those mortgages. So they handpicked the mortgages they thought would fail, and then uh, with a small insurance premium uh, could recover 100% of the value of the mortgage they did not own. And 
uh, if you read The Big Short or saw the movie, you know they collected big time. And in fact, uh, because they were betting on mortgages failing, uh, some houses had nine bets on them by outsiders, side bets, that those mortgages would fail. Uh, there were three to four times as many naked credit default swaps as there were credit default swaps. These people recovered billions. Uh, in fact, the problem became because credit default swaps were deregulated by virtue of a 2000 law that we got handed to us by Phil Graham in the Senate, supporting, supported by Larry Summers, Secretary of the Treasury, credit default swaps in 2000 were put outside the boundaries of law. They were unknown. Financial regulators had no idea what was going on. Uh, they were not capitalized. There were no anti-fraud protections. Uh, and uh, uh, it came as a great shock to Messrs. Bernanke and Paulson and others when Lehman failed and right after it to have AIG present itself saying it was 80 billion in the hole, later became 100 billion because they had issued these swaps. Nobody knew about it. There were no capital reserves. There were no anti-fraud provisions. Uh, and uh, uh, the shortfall, essentially, to pay off the winners of those bets uh, had to be funded by the United States taxpayer. Now, I'm not saying it's the only cause, but it was a very big cause. In 2010, Dodd-Frank has passed. Its number one goal is that the United States taxpayer should never again be put in the position of having to bail out the world's largest bank to the tune of tr trillions of dollars. In aid of that goal, Dodd-Frank set up a regulatory regime for swaps. They had to be reported. They had to be cleared. They had to be exchange traded. There had to be capital set aside. They were collateralized. And there were a lot of anti-competitive things that were stopped where banks were trying to control the market to the detriment of everyone else. So uh, that was 2010, three years. The CFTC, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, is the principal regulatory agency. Over a three-year period, they promulgate 60 sub substantive rules to implement the statute. Uh, but then they're confronted with the issue, what happens to swaps that get traded outside the United States? AIG, Financial Products, the company that lost all that money, was a London subsidiary. Later, uh, the so-called London rogue who lost $6.2 billion for J.P. Morgan Chase on his own was a London branch of J.P. Morgan Chase. The key senators specifically said, we've got problems with what especially the big US banks are doing abroad. Dodd-Frank must, in certain circumstances, apply to swaps outside the United States. Who's uh, what swaps in? And this is what the statute provides. If a swap could add, a swaps trading could adversely affect the US economy, it should be regulated by Dodd-Frank. If the swap is a ruse, conducting it in a foreign location to avoid Dodd-Frank, it should be covered by Dodd-Frank. Now, I quickly want to say that my focus here is not on everyone. My focus is on the four big US bank holding company swap dealers who control 90% of the United States market. As far as I'm concerned, if they can be prevented from collapse, I have little worry about other financial institutions. The banks through their uh, trade organization, the United, uh, the uh, Financial Swaps Derivatives Association, International, ISDA, uh, did the following. In July 2013, the CFTC, in a very complicated, quote, guidance, close quote, made one point clear. If a subsidiary of a US person or US bank holding company is guaranteed by the bank, that is, if a subsidiary fails, the bank holding company will stand behind its obligations, uh, Dodd-Frank applies, even though it's foreign. 
1992 from 1992 to that point in time, all U.S. bank holding companies, swap dealers, were guaranteed by their parent. They had to be guaranteed because as the market was developing, nobody would have done business with the subsidiaries unless they knew that the parent was standing behind it. <laughs> by 2013, everyone knows, or at least believes, that these banks are too big to fail. What do I mean by that? That if they collapse, the US taxpayer will likely be called upon again to bail them out. That, uh, as a study I cite by Tom Ferguson, INET's re research director, that too big to fail concept is embedded in the stock price of those big banks. Uh, July 2013, the CFTC says, if your subsidiary is guaranteed, it's covered. August 2013, under cover of darkness, with no public announcement, the International Swap Securities Association gives its members, including these four banks, language to de-guarantee their subsidiaries. That had never been done before. Now you might ask, who will do business with a de-guaranteed subsidiary? Well, the answer is the real guarantee is by you, the United States taxpayer. The expectation is if the bank holding company fails because of bad practices by its subsidiary, even though the subsidiary may not be legally guaranteed that the bank will be rescued, or the thinking was, if we don't rescue these banks, we will confront the second great uh, depression. Uh, this, it took a while for the CFTC to know that the banks were doing this de-guarantee process. They, they did notice that US swaps were suddenly moving outside the United States market to foreign mo markets, mostly the European Union. Uh, to shorten the story, in October 2016, uh, over three years after the de-guarantee loophole was established, the CFTC proposed a rule that would have closed this. They said, this guaranteed de guarantee stuff is fiction. What we worry about is, is the subsidiary on the consolidated books, the swaps trading, on the consolidated books of the bank holding company? If it is, and most are, then the subsidiary must follow Dodd-Frank wherever in the world it does business. Again, these are four US bank holding companies. They are headquartered in the United States. Their principal place of business is in the United States. They've already been bailed out by US taxpayers. They've been deemed to be systemically risky uh, by the banking regulators. Uh, and they've engineered what I call the de-guarantee loophole. There are other loopholes. One quick one I would just notice. In October 2016, the CFTC discovered that these banks were executing the swaps in Wall Street. Uh, it's called the ANE, Assign, Negotiate, Execute, in Wall Street, and then after completed execution, sending them off to foreign subsidiaries. And the CFTC said, that's not right, and they wanted to put an end to it. Suffice it to say, with the election of Donald Trump and uh, a Trump CFTC, that proposed rule to make a proposed rule a final rule, you have to go a lot through a lot of procedures. It can't be done instantly. If it's done in a year, it's fast. So the October 2016 uh, proposed rule to end the de-guarantee loophole and the A&E loophole was never finalized by the time President Trump was inaugurated. Uh, as you know, the, the entire thinking of the Trump uh, uh, economic financial uh, infrastructure is to roll back Dodd-Frank to, uh, uh, to accommodate uh, the big banks. Uh, so it's never going to be fixed in the absence of some extraordinary action uh, to be taken place. Um, the paper says there is a remedy available. It's not going to be the CFTC. It's certainly not going to be the Republican-controlled Congress who will fix this. But the Commodities Act gives state attorney generals 
and state financial regulators the right to go into federal court to sue over violations that they can show will have an adverse impact on the citizens of the state. That's great. The one problem is, as I say in the paper, and Senator Dodd said this in spades, the uh, understanding of the swaps market, somewhat aided by Michael Lewis, somewhat aided by the Pope, uh, is not very good. It is the least understand, understood of all the financial markets. Not because it's so complicated, but because everything has a confusing name associated with it, a naked credit default swap, which is really insurance on property or, or assets that you don't own. You can't call it insurance because it would be regulated. So it's a naked credit default swap, collateralized debt obligations, asset-backed securities. Um, the biggest problem we have in getting state attorney generals to do this, who, by the way, in other fields have been very aggressive in the financial sector, is a lack of understanding. And my hope is that the paper will provide them and others with the fundamental tools to understand what's going on here. The four big bank holding companies putting their trading abroad. Dodd-Frank applies under Dodd-Frank if that trading could adversely impact the US economy. Well, we've seen that movie already. Moreover, if it's a ruse to get out of Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank applies. Is this a ruse when you're executing the swap in the United States and after execution is completed, sending it off to a foreign subsidiary? Basically, to just take advantage of the the guarantee loophole. If that isn't a ruse, I don't know what is. Uh, this can and should be fixed. Unfortunately, we're at the mercy of state attorneys general, and I think that's our mission to work with them, to have them bring lawsuits that would declare this, as it really is, a, a plain violation of the plain language of the extraterritorial provision in Dodd-Frank. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael, um, for that overview. Um, Paul, I thought I'd start with you. Um, one of the things that seems to echo throughout this paper is it seems like back to the future. It seems like we're back to 04, 05, and 06, where international regulatory arbitrage was happening, where the biggest global banks were searching the world for the lightest touch regulation. And London actually bragged about having light touch regulation. And it, it can't be a coincidence that many of the derivatives problems U.S. banks have had happen to happen in London. I mean, it's a wild coincidence. And we have banks today doing essentially the same thing, of where they're moving their high-risk, dangerous act derivatives activities overseas. And one of their primary arguments, as you know, Paul, because you've heard it for years, is that in order for us, the banks, to maintain their global competitiveness or their leadership in financial products, they have to go search the globe and go where the lightest touch. Um, as a prudential regulator for so long, um, how, did you, how do you think through that argument, and what do you think of that argument? <laughs> it's a big argument. <laughs> it's a complicated world. Um, look, I don't know what I can bring to this uh, uh, little meeting. Rob adequately described what's been going wrong. You have a very detailed explanation here of one aspect. Uh, I happen to be. 90 years old. You do a little subtraction. I started out in banking 70 years ago. And I've been in and out of banking and government for 70 years. What strikes me is I've seen it all before. <laughs> <laughs> I, over and over again in different degrees of complication. And it has gotten indeed more complicated. You listen to Michael here, you can realize down in the woods how how complicated it is. You talk about this international competition. I can remember back, <laughs> you know, it wasn't so long ago when American banks couldn't even branch outside their own state, uh, much less become huge international institutions. And I, I remember testifying once, isn't this terrible? American banks can't survive. They have these big overseas banks like the Deutsche Bank 
a prime example of beauty in banking operating around the world, and here we are, come from those Japanese banks <laughs> who are so big and powerful we can't deal with them. I, uh, you know, I was, I didn't care how big the banks were. I, said, I just want to, I worry about how good they are. I didn't worry enough about how, how good they are. Well, now all those restraints are gone, and it's gotten more and more complicated, but the, the underlying uh, concerns are, in many ways, pretty much the same. Uh, how we go from ricochet from one banking crisis to another, uh, I don't know. I, in my old age, I don't know why I got inspired to write a memoir. And at this point, when it's practically finished, I wonder why I did this. Chapter one, chapter two repeats chapter one. <laughs> 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 repeats the previous chapter. And it's a complicated world. Uh, the international cooperation, I think, among central banks and, and governments has actually gotten better, not worse. Uh, we never had a big effort to get international uh, capital rules in the 1980s. That was a big initiative at the time. Uh, we're still not happy with the same old debate. Should it be a leverage ratio? Should it be risk-based? We fought all that battle in the 1980s. We're fighting it again now, and you know we end up with both, which is is fine. But uh, you know what's different? Put it quite simply, you know, Washington, D.C. As late as the 1970s, Washington had one considered four-star hotel. One. It had one restaurant that was considered a top class French restaurant. It had a few lobbyists around. It did not have, until the 70s, an out-of-town law firm in Washington. Now those little local law firms, prestigious, it used to be on one floor in an office building. And then, you know, in the 1980s, it got to be two floors. <laughs> One of my best friends in government with me a long time became a lawyer in a big national law firm right across the street from the Treasury. They expanded into two floors. Ten years later, they bought an office building. Ten years after that, they bought another office building. One law firm, two office buildings. How many law firms are there now? Too many. <laughs> how, how many fancy hotels are there in Washington, D.C.? You can't count them anymore. Who are two of the four most richest counties in the United States per, per capita income outside Washington, D.C.? What are those people doing? Montgomery and Fairfax. What are they doing? We've got an industry generating hundreds of millions of dollars of lobbying. And you know, you need some lobbying, you need some truth telling. But when does it become just so outrageous? And the campaign expenditures are so great and loom so large for the congressman that they're susceptible to any little visit from a friendly uh, lobbyist who, before he leaves, says, yes, I do remember when your next fundraiser is. Uh, I'll get off subject here, but I'm getting, now I think I'm on subject. You were talking about derivatives. That's a big deal. Hard oh, done from nothing, invented hardly existed 20 years ago. Just since it sometimes rises, let me raise a question about so-called Volcker rule. You know what that is. It's yes. <laughs> it says if you're getting government subsidized directly or indirectly, you shouldn't be doing a lot of speculation. What did I read a couple of years ago? 
This one really hurt me a little bit. American Bankers Association. That's a big deal in Washington. 20 years ago, they weren't even in Washington. The American Bankers Association was in New York. Now they're all in Washington. But what I read, this uh, it concerned me. Statement. Rather than solving problems, the vocal role has created problems. Okay. How? It has operated to impede the efficient operation of the financial system. Oh, how did that happen? I don't know. It drives banks away from providing services valued by their customers. Like maybe Wells Fargo out there. And, uh, it reduces competition in affected markets. Not quite sure what markets they're talking about. But, but what really hurt, it is an overall drag on the economy. Little did I know that my little rule would be an overall drag on the economy. <laughs> Jesus, we got unemployment under 4% now. If we didn't have the Volcker rule, maybe it'd be 2%, 1.5%. <laughs> I mean, we've only had 10 years of <clears throat> uninterrupted expansion. We have loans rising faster than the GDP. You've got small loans going up faster than big loans. I mean, you know, I, I really got upset by reading all this stuff. I opened up the Financial Times yesterday. Big headline. U.S. banks poised to end out $170 billion. Hand out $170 billion because they're suffering because of the vocal rule. <laughs> they, uh, how can they possibly do it? Dividends and buybacks exceed profits. I pick up the New York Times this morning. I got to go read something. <laughs> Headline, will we ever drain the swamp? And it talks a three column <laughs> op-ed piece about the uh, advisory business about lobbying, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on lobbying. Now, what do we do about it? I don't know. But I do think things have gotten more complicated because of technology. It's harder to deal with. But what strikes me in going back over the 70 years, and you could go back longer, how much some of the complaints that were apparent then are apparent today. And one that stands out is, why do we have five regulatory agencies overseeing the banking system? I heard great complaints about it 70 years ago. Competition and laxity. Unwillingness to press banks and other financial institutions for fear that the other agency will, you know which one that typically is with the banks, will go ahead and not insist. Banking regulation is a very tough business. And you can't compress it into rules hundreds of pages long which try to cover every possible detail of what could go wrong. It's not just a problem with banking regulation, it's a problem with accounting and a lot of other things. And if you don't have a strong regulatory system to deal with it in a common sense kind of way, you're in trouble. And what struck me is that that was a problem 70 years ago. And it's a problem. You read Mr. Geithner's books about the crisis. Read Mr. Bernanke. Read Mr. Paulson. Republican, Democrat, neutral, all complaining about the this regulatory system that's still in place and getting worse with its overlaps and, and uh, inconsistencies and failures to deal with some problems. I've been there. I, I know about it. Uh, 
You could criticize, were we tough enough regulator when I was there? I, I thought we were being tough, we weren't tough enough. How do we deal with this problem, which is a governance problem? And it's related to the broader governance problem that Rob was talking about. But it is a, a very real problem, and it's going to take a lot of um, effort to, to carry through this. You know, there's been a lot of talk about this vocal well, I try to stay away from all this. I'm too old and all the rest. But uh, you had this bill that passed a month or two ago, and now you got this proposed regulation. I am told, and you can make a very good case, both are desirable. Both are an effort to simplify. God, God knows who could use some simplification. To what degree, and this is unknown, is it going to become a vehicle for weakening the substance, weakening the core? If it's simplification, great. If this is a subterfuge and opening the way to diluting the core, it's just one little example. I think it's relatively little in the whole scheme of things, but an example of how difficult it is to get coherent effective, disciplined regulation against an overpoweringly different environment in terms of the money and resources spent on finance and the electoral process and in the lobbying world. I think this is a, a huge challenge for the country. Uh, you know, I can think of imaginative ways of dealing with it. What chance they have of success is another question. So let me, I'll stop emoting and... Uh, <laughs> and well, thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, but we'll, we'll give you a quick short answer. You know, DC has is now in the loophole creation and exploitation business. And you've well talked about that. And you, your question was, what do we do about it? Well, what I would say is uh, there's some obvious things to do about it. And one is to support those who fight back. INET, Better Markets, read Steve Brill's new book called Tailspin that highlights 10 different organizations that are fighting back to try and provide a counterweight to the money and power of special interest. The uphill battle, but they don't get anywhere near the support that the industry gets for all the obvious reasons. So short plug, but I'll move on. Uh, Michael ended his talk by talking about a lack of understanding of derivatives due to what I call industry-created complexity. They use it as an intimidation weapon. They use it against the regulators, against knowledgeable people in the general public. But part of the problem with lack of understanding is they're also in the active concealment business. One of the benefits, quote unquote benefits, of moving derivatives overseas is they don't have the Dodd-Frank reporting requirements. So you don't even have the information to try and understand it. Now, Tom, as a regulator for many, many years and a warrior um, for sensible, modest regulation, both so that the public can be informed and the regulators can be informed and do their job. What, what's your take on Michael's thesis? Well, um, let, me, let me start by saying that Michael's paper is, is about more than an obscure a footnote that allows them to move this stuff. It's, it's a history of uh, the industry's lobbying practice mm. of removing their barriers to the pursuit of uh, increasing risk backed by taxpayers. And so when you go through the history and you see it in the 90s where the efforts were to at least get some sense of what was going on with the derivatives book, it was batted back by not only the industry but some of the regulators. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is now we've carried that forward. People say, what crisis? Uh, the, the traders today, remember it's 10 years ago, things are great, so you leave it behind. And so what you're finding yourself with today is a, a, a well-subsidized uh, industry. Too big to fail is a huge subsidy. It allows you to take on marginal risk beyond what you would otherwise take because your counterparty, your creditor, if you will, is confident that you'll be bailed out. And that is a huge competitive advantage for these particular uh, players, and that's why they're going to fight any kind of rule that restricts that. And one of my points is, if the public 
or if the counterparty or the creditor truly believed that this institution would be allowed to fail, a lot of this activity would shrink because they're not going to put up with no capital. They're not going to put up with opaque positions in derivatives around the world. They're going to insist on knowing things, and we've left that behind. And I think what Michael's paper did is, is show this gap between what was intended in Dodd-Frank and the Volcker Rule and what was accomplished. And until you change the, the subsidy and the too-big-to-fail problem, and you're not going to get the too-big-to-fail problem solved through more regulation. That's why for years I've said we, it's not just simplify the rules, it's simplify the industry these largest, because they're universal banks. You cannot be a broker dealer independent and compete successfully with a universal bank. You just don't have the subsidy they have. So we'll see that grind away as we did earlier. So it's a, it's a real issue. And the real problem is how do you get these institutions in a position to be allowed to fail? Uh, not all at once, but allowed to fail and with confidence. And until you do that, you find a footnote, you play the footnote. The, the regulator is slow to react, so it's already outside the reach. Uh, you'll see that over and over again. And to Paul's point, I, I, it may be a little bit off topic, but it's not really when you come to the rate. The Volcker rule, designed to say simply, you cannot gamble with deposit insured funds and a backstop of liquidity that is uh, almost infinite in its uh, availability, uh, you, 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 you cannot do that. And now we have, uh, in the implementation, it was made far more complicated than it needed to be. My point then, and I think Paul's was, thou shalt not yes. engage in this activity. If we have strong supervision, we will test you, and if you are, uh, we will fine you, or uh, you will be held accountable for it. And what I've, and what is in this, even this revised uh, proposal is, and your CEO has to attest to this fact. But when you read the proposal, it's kind of an example of what we saw here with this obscure footnote. When you read the proposal that's about there, it is 400 pages long. It is as complex as the rule. It has 300 plus questions that are, pardon my words, designed, I think, to raise the possibility of repealing VOPR, not simplifying it. And those are all things that, that we have to be aware of. And, and to finally, to Paul's point, uh, I've been only in Washington six years, and I'm going back to Kansas City. Uh, <laughs> but my point is, when I, when I looked at the Capitol, and it's a beautiful place, and I said, it's now an anthill, not a hill, because all the lobbyists 15,000 or so swarming around that, that, that uh, mound, you have a sense of why these things are increasingly complicated and easily gained. And the complexity is designed for the gaming of the system. So I have, I have real concerns about uh, how we'll do this and, t and what we end up with is a new crisis. I don't know when, I'm not predicting one, but when you put $600 trillion of derivatives and you don't know what's in them, and you don't know how much of it is, you know, when you're netting all kinds of one swap against another that they're completely different, you are asking for trouble because you are ignorant in, the, in, in what's going on, and that's a prescription for trouble. Only in Washington, D.C., would some bunch of regulators propose a rule that's 400 pages long and, and shamelessly claim that it's to simplify a 700-page prior rule. <laughs> um, so, Michael, you know, you went over a lot of really interesting things in the paper, um, and again, I'd encourage you all to read it, but one of them uh, I thought you spelled out well and is really important and should offend everybody's uh, uh, sense of rightness here, which is the concept of substituted compliance. So the CFTC basically made up this thing where if foreign jurisdictions say that they're going to regulate um, the foreign activities of U.S. banks in their jurisdiction like we regulate them, then oh fine, we'll let them regulate them. And so, but to me, it sounds like, A, we're outsourcing the protection of US taxpayers to foreign regulators, and those foreign regulators actually have an unbroken record of failure. So I'm curious, 
uh, why that is, and I, I hope you weave it in, but uh, Sharon Bowen, who is a fantastic former commissioner of the CFTC, did an excellent job in a dissent on a vote that was very important, detailing uh, how crazy this is. So when I talk about my brilliant insight here, I'm uh, now co properly crediting Sharon. Um, but if you want to talk about that, maybe, because sure. I think that people can understand why, at least if a U.S. regulator is supposed to do something they feel, there's at least a theoretical possibility of dragging up to Congress, put it in the name in the paper. <coughs> but if it's somebody in London, <coughs> Paris, or Brussels, you know, the reach of the U.S. accountability system such as it is doesn't exist. Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. I just would want to say two things. I don't think in my talk I emphasize that the International Swaps Derivatives Association, for their authority for the de-guarantee loophole, relies on footnote 536 of an 80-page, single-spaced, triple-column uh, document put up at the CFTC that had 662 footnotes. So this all derives, as the commentators have said, from reading a footnote that really doesn't, uh, doesn't give the support for this dramatic, uh, dramatic loophole. Secondly, even if a subsidiary is guaranteed, even if a subsidiary is otherwise under Dodd-Frank, the CFTC created out of whole cloth a further exemption. Um, and that is, the, uh, any number of stakeholders can apply to the CFTC for something called substituted compliance. So if you are guaranteed, you're covered by Dodd-Frank. But under a wholly made up doctrine by the CFTC, uh, the bank, the country, almost anybody can apply to have the foreign government's rule substitute for Dodd-Frank. Uh, uh, as was said, uh, Commissioner Bowen, Bowen wrote a phenomenal, which I quote extensively, dissent to using a Japanese rule to substitute for a Dodd-Frank rule, showing that it's, it's a uh, Potemkin village of regulation. The other big substituted uh, uh, regulation is the European Union. And all I can say is look at Deutsche Bank. <laughs> Deutsche Bank is in the hands of the great regulators of the European Union, as was Northern Rock, as was HSBC, as was the London LIBOR problem, as was the money laundering by HSBC. So essentially, and what happened is, the European Union said to the CFT, there was a trade war. They said, look, if you're going to apply Dodd-Frank when your U.S. companies do business in our, in our jurisdiction, when they do business in our jurisdiction and are regulated by us, we're going to regulate them out of existence. So if you want to help your banks, you better use our regulation as it is without all the drama of making it harder for U.S. banks. And it was essentially a trade war. And the CFTC, in giving substituted compliance to the EU, was clear they were conceding something to get out of what they thought was a trade war with the EU. Uh, and as I said, Commissioner Bowen's dissent and the Japanese substitute compliance says it all. But again, if the purpose of Dodd-Frank is to regulate so as to avoid the US taxpayer, bailing out to the tune of trillions of dollars, not just US banks, but foreign banks. Uh, let's say there is a collapse of a big US bank holding company because it was regulated by the European Union. What is the average person going to say in, when they are explained as the bailout progresses Oh, we tried to take care of this. We gave it to the European Union to regulate Citibank, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, and Bank of America. It just makes no sense. But uh, as uh, the economy seems to be booming, uh, there's, as I say in my paper, there's a lot of writing.
by very respected people saying indebtedness, consumer indebtedness, is mounting to the extent that mortgage indebtedness happened in 2007, 2008. Defaults on cons uh, auto loans, student loans, credit card debt are skyrocketing. Banks are losing a lot of money out of this. Oh, and by the way, all this indebtedness has the very same financial engineering that surrounded mortgages in 2007. Asset-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, and yes, naked credit default swaps. In other words, people are betting that student loans, auto loans, credit card debt will not be paid off even though they are not extending the debt. The final thing what I, I would say is the good news in all this is I think we really took a turn for the worse by bringing in the Trump deregulatory philosophy. Um, the Tea Party got started as an opposition to US bank bailouts. Progressives are opposed to US bank bailouts. There was this sort of quasi-deregulatory bill passed, S2155. I talk about it in my paper. It was for small banks. Banks know more than $250 billion in assets. That sounds like a lot. JP Morgan has $2.5 billion in assets. Trillion. Trillion. Trillion in assets. I'm sorry. I lose track of the dollar sign. <laughs> uh, J.P. Morgan and Citi said, oh, this is for banks up to 250. We want to take advantage of this. The outcry against that was overwhelming. Uh, shareholders meetings of Citi, people were getting up saying, don't put yourself and my money in the position we were back in 2007, 2008. Even the conservative Republican senators who supported the modest deregulatory loophole said, we are not going to pass legislation that deregulates the biggest US banks. The problem is we do not have uh, a spokesperson uh, in, in power to be able to take advantage of that bias against deregulation, and certainly not in this administration. But I. I as I said, I think the immediate uh, way out of this is to get state attorney generals to bring lawsuits. They can do so under the Commodity Act. But in the long run, uh, I think uh, regulating big banks does resonate politically. We just need a spokesperson for it. Well, um, before I hand it over to Rob for the Q&A, uh, I, I want to say terrific discussion about a really important topic, but it's important to keep in mind that what we're talking about is derivatives regulation under the CFTC. The same type of loophole, loophole creation and exploitation and deregulation is happening at the Fed with capital, liquidity, counterparty, et cetera. The same thing is happening at the SEC in various areas and at the OCC and at the CFPB, where uh, interestingly the acting director said, um, you know, when I was in Congress, if you were a lobbyist and you gave me money, I'd see you. And if you were not a lobbyist, if you were a lobbyist and you didn't give me money, I wouldn't see you. Um, so this is actually just one piece of a much broader picture of massive deregulation that's happening across the board throughout the financial industry in Washington, D.C. today. So thank you all for that. And Rob, um, we'll uh, lead the Q&A. Let's see. Start with Dan, and then we'll work over here. Hi, Dan. One The, the notional amount metrics relative to the metrics before the crisis. And Tom, uh, Dan Trullo, before he left us, he didn't really leave us. But, <laughs> before he left Washington. Before he left Washington. <laughs> you know, view, viewed the adjustment of uh, regulatory, bank regulatory regime as between the US and Europe as an evolving process. And he was willing to give them some time. I think he said that back in 2014 or 15. Whatever happened to the notion of aligning uh, the regulatory regimes? Are we, is, is that just flown off the table at this point? Michael, please. Yeah, if I can just quickly say, 
that I have a history of the European Union and the G20. 2008, they say, let's hold hands. We're all going to regulate derivatives. Here are our principles. Only two countries adopted those principles, the United States and arguably Japan. As the, we move further away from the crisis, the uh, European regulators were captured. They have not put in place Dodd-Frank-like principles. And the thesis is 2008 was a once-in-lifetime experience. And it'll never happen again. So who, who cares? And with uh, Chairman Powell telling us, and I, he has basis for saying that, we're in an economic boom. Uh, that's fine. But Stephen Perlstein just wrote a long column for the Washington Post. I talked about student debt, credit card debt, uh, uh, auto loan debt. He points out that the big corporations have extended themselves by borrowing to buy back their stocks. He sees that. So there's a lot out there. As people have said, I'm not saying I predict a crisis, but we are not in a utopian economic situation. The Europeans, look, Deutsche Bank, the Italian banks, the Spanish banks, the Portugal banks, the British banks are all in serious problems. They're readying bailouts already for those various banks. Do we want to give those people the substituted compliance responsibility in our, uh, our uh, uh, regulatory scheme? Dan, what was your first question? Yeah, well, that's a great question. There was an article published by Reuters, which I cite in my paper in 2015 by a, man, by a man named Levinson. And he estimates that 95% of certain swap lines have left the United States and gone abroad, mostly to Europe. Now, he, lately, that calculus has been uh, attacked as not being accurate. But look, when you're dealing with $600 trillion, you don't have to show 95% is exposed. One bank recently said, well, we're only operating 5% of our swaps outside of Dodd-Frank. Well, 5% of $600 trillion, that's a lot of money. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, one rogue trader in 2012, lost $6.2 billion. Now, J.P. Morgan Chase has reserves that could cover that, but a lot of financial institutions don't. And what if it wasn't just one trader in London? What if it was a bunch? The metrics are hard to come by because of the lack of transparency. If you're getting out of the reporting requirements of Dodd-Frank, it becomes difficult to get precise information. Interestingly, the Bank of England just said their observation of the swaps market is a lot of swaps are moving out of the United States into the European Union. But we can't get metrics. What we need is uh, to have somebody with subpoena power to get the information. The CFTC would not have tried to close this loophole in October 2016 if they didn't think they were losing regulatory control over the swaps market. OK, what I'd like to do is take about four questions. I see one, two, three, four. So start with the lady over here, and then uh, work your way around. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Lucy Commissar. I'm a journalist. Uh, to what extent does the uh, movement of these derivatives into Europe relate to Rehypothecation. Is this a part of rehypothecation? Is it, is it parallel to rehypothecation? This reminds me that the course I took in law school that dealt with rehypothecation, I think I failed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not in a position to answer your question. I, I would tell you that it is probably not related to rehypothecation. Uh, it's more of moving the activity actually out into a subsidiary right. in a foreign country where reapothecation is taking the collateral and using it again to lever up a little bit further. So uh, it's, it's, it's a different kind of risk. The moving across is if you move, if, you, if you're arbitraging the regulatory framework and moving from a stricter to a less strict, 
which is what that footnote uh, began the motion on. That's one level of risk, and it does mean increased leverage, perhaps. It does mean less transparency. It does mean easier margin requirements, so you do have risk. The reapothecation says, well, I have this collateral that's sitting here. I got to use it somehow, so I, I borrow against it again, again using again. someone else's, and that's why you have the, the very but, rapid roll down. Right, that's, that's the arbitrage of the regulatory framework. So you move it from one jurisdiction to another to get a better deal, and that's what goes on there with the reapplication process. Mm. Yeah, and we did, we, did, we did limit in the U.S. the reapplication abilities of some of these firms uh, to, the, to the betterment of the financial uh, stability issue in the United States. Why don't we go through and ask the three questions and then the panel okay. can take with that and then we'll have to tie things so, up. So thank you all. This has been fascinating, if, if frightening. Um, <laughs> and thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, I'm curious, given and Paul Volcker said that you can't put this into a rule, whether, whether sort of dramatically increasing capital requirements and even I mean, not just to banks, but, but long-term capital kind of show that you can have a crisis in a, in a hedge fund that would be a sort of more promising approach than, than trying to, to rewrite the rules. I, I just wanted to ask the panel, um, so about three weeks ago, a story came out that the Goldman Sachs equity derivatives desk in one day, in, Feb in February 5th of earlier this year, made $200 million. Now, it's hard to say that that was market making operations and wasn't pro proprietary trade. And what I found it, I'd love to get the, just the response from the panel, what, what, you, what you thought of that, but the story literally lasted a day, and then we just moved on, and boy, those guys at Goldman Sachs are really smart, and we just moved on. And this was done with derivatives, it's, a lot of it was derivatives, equity derivatives, specifically the, the VIX and, and, and volatility derivatives. Um, so it seems as though business is going on as usual. Um, I just, do you have any, any insight or any, uh, any you know, just reaction to that? Where's the other one? Uh, I want to, uh, to take a slightly different, different tack because I, I share the concern uh, of, of the uh, paper writer and the panel that we go in and get relative to GDP <coughs> is very unlikely to, to end well. And uh, a lot of it is taking advantage of government guarantees try to write regulations to avoid the exploitation of government guarantees. But it's the government guarantees <coughs> in the first place that kind of allow for the exploitation. And I'm wondering if the time hasn't come to uh, why do we need banks? There's enough expansion of credit from all kinds of sources uh, that if the Federal Reserve, if, if people could just buy treasury bills directly, and have their cash and treasury bills, interest bearing. If they wanted to invest in something that they had lent, it would be just like a, a mutual fund without any underlying or implicit uh, guarantee. And I think if we took away those implicit guarantees, we would solve 90% of these of these problems. And I'm wondering if there's enough credit available. Uh, it seemed to me that it is that the whole idea of, of, of banks is uh, uh, per se. Well, to answer some of the questions as they've come up, uh, hoping that this can be corrected by increased capital, I think, given the, the direction today of decreasing capital over, uh, overall, is just, it's not going to happen. I think uh, 
Chairman Volker and Vice Chair Honig could answer that more directly. I did want to say something because Chairman Volker is here about the Volker Rule that is very important. It isn't directly affected by what I've discussed because I don't think the banks have been able to use shuttling money to Europe to get out of the Volcker Rule. But the point that's important, and, what, and I want to emphasize as part of Chairman Volcker's thesis, when he, first of all, the Volcker Rule, I think all of us would agree, was a very, very important recommendation. When Chairman Volcker proposed it to President Obama, it was contained in a three-page letter. Uh, jumping over the history, uh, there are five different regulators who have to promulgate a Volcker rule. Those rules are hundreds and hundreds of pages long. The new effort to uh, redo them is, quote, to simplify them, now reduces it to another several hundred pages. But Chairman Volcker has said something very, very important. Uh, he has said that the Volcker Rule could be four pages long. You just outline the prohibition, and then you have the CEO and the boards be liable for its violation. Too much of what we're doing, and I think this comes out of the fact, as Senator Dodd made clear, Congress didn't know what it was doing when it passed Dodd-Frank. So every time they had a corrective, they said to the agencies, you promulgate rules, which is a very long, complicated process that invites the participation of lobbyists in trying to limit the rule. Um, the VOCA rule and the extraterritorial rule. If your swap trades are going to have a serious adverse impact on the US economy if they go wrong, you don't need an 80-page guidance on that. The more traditional form of regulation was, here's the rule. If you violate it, you're in trouble. Now go out and figure out what it is. Not, as I think Chairman Volcker said, and maybe Vice Chairman Honig, not to write a rule that looks for every conceivable uh, option in terms of applying the rule and in that process giving the banks leeway. Because, you know, a rulemaking, you have to file comments if you want influence. Filing comments is expensive. Uh, Dennis, I, and others have filed comments, but we don't have limitless resources. The banks do. And also, they're in lobbying the commissioners of the CFTC. That's public information. So many simple prohibitions in Dodd-Frank should have just been left as prohibitions. And you can't kill somebody. You don't go through a rulemaking to say, what is killing? Uh, or any other crime, there's no rulemaking. The rulemakings are just draining the life out of Dodd-Frank. Can I, I'll, I'll come in a couple, starting with the last. I agree that one of the things that's happened are these enormous subsidies that come through with the implied and explicit guarantees from the government. In fact, that's one of the reasons I think Washington is growing so quickly, because we're not subjecting ourselves to the market as much. We're relying on Washington for favors. And that changes the dynamics and the risk appetite, and we're seeing that. So that's why you have to get this idea of too big to fail back off, or this will only grow. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And, and I, I'm not optimistic, but at least we ought to keep fighting that. And one of the, that brings us to the second point, capital. Now, there's a thousand, not a thousand, there's dozens of capital measures that we use. And I've been a strong proponent of a simple, tangible leverage ratio, because it tells me how much money I can lose before I'm broke. That's what the market wants to know, that's what I want to know. So if I can see what you're doing to risk, I know how much leeway you have. And we've, we've completely moved away from that. We have this very complicated risk-weighted system that is, uh, uh, confuses everyone. So we need to simplify. <laughs> and the most systemically important institutions in the world are 
the least well capitalized. I mean, a little community bank in Western Kansas has more capital per dollar of assets than the largest banks in the United States. Now, whether that's good or bad, we might debate, but at least talk about the same thing. And I think that is a real issue because the idea now is if you have the guarantee, lever up, because you, you, you more easily increase your ROE, the bonuses come in. So that will be a constant problem as long as you have this explicit and implied guarantee. I, I want to then very comment on, your, on the cooperation. Everyone wants to cooperate except for their special case. And the, the Bank of International Settlements that I, I have a lot of respect for, uh, you have this, the supervision committee, the various countries come in, try and come to an agreement, but behind that is every country's, shall we say, uh, anchor institution. And even in building the capital ratios up, whether it was risk-weighted or otherwise, leverage ratio afterwards, uh, it's easy to say, yeah, we need more capital, but, but. And so then the, the cooperation and discussion kind of weakens at that point. So it's, it's always local interest first, and that will always be the case, which is why the cross-border issues, will, we haven't begun to solve those. Ring fencing will be the call of the day if we have another crisis. Yes. So cooperation is important. I always want to keep striving. And in today's dynamics and world, I don't think we're headed that way. We're headed the other way. We'll see what happens. It's also fascinating that people talk about capital. They say how much and what type. Nobody ever says, well, what against what? What is how much or how little? Right. So if you look at the, the data done on the crash of 07, 08, 09, the first question should be, what was the capital shortfall that US taxpayers had to bail, fill in? Right? What was that? Well, it appears, because there has not been any robust comprehensive analysis, of north of 20% was the capital shortfall when you look at it. That's after being backstopped by the full faith and credit of the United States. The shortfall is about 22% or something. Right. And we're talking, we're arguing about what are the capital levels at the biggest banks? Yeah. Well, today they're using yes. capital leverage tangible. Right. They're about six and a half percent. Six and a half, right? A so and in Europe, it's 200 basis points less. So they, theoretically, they can't <coughs> even weather a crisis less than a third Right, worse than it was before. So well, and you have to remember, it, it, let's let's say it's six percent. It's not six percent that you can lose. Right. You can lose only a fraction of that before people become absolutely paralyzed, and the liquidity crisis emerges, and that's when everything runs. And that's the real danger that we face. Of course, you can also say they doubled the capital. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, you know, oh, I'm they do all the time. It, well, <laughs> It was somebody from the Fed, I don't remember his name, but somebody, when somebody was making that argument back in 2010 or 2012, somebody said, well, you know, two times zero doesn't get you very far. So, you know, I mean, double, the doubling was always comforting. And somebody said, well, why don't you triple it? <laughs> well, we better tie up. I, I'm thinking of the old Billy Preston song, nothing from nothing equals nothing. <laughs> but uh, I, I think there are a lot of themes here today. First of all, we have four very experienced, extraordinary people who've done a lot of public service here. And as we're trying to manage in our society this question of legitimacy and trust and representation in a complex domain, I'm reminded of John Kenneth Galbraith's statement. Uh, you should all read this book. It's called The Short History of Financial Euphoria. It's only about 100 pages, and it's fantastic for the, how would I say, the farce that our society repeatedly uh, returns to. And he says, for practical purposes, the financial memory should be assumed to last at a maximum no more than 20 years. This is normally the time it takes for the recollection of one disaster to be erased and for some variant on previous dementia to come forward to capture the financial mind. And so here we are at halftime. <laughs> <laughs> and we have these diligent, public servants reminding us not to uh, relinquish, and I, not to relinquish what you might call awareness, stay vigilant. And there are two themes in this. I, I don't know how much you know about the structure of blues music, but it kind of goes like this. I have no idea what to do. <laughs> I have no idea what to do. Let's get back to work. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I think of two songs like a central today. Banker. What's that? You sound like a central banker. <laughs> <laughs> That's a central banker blues. 
that's good. Uh, yeah. So, so there's two, there's kind of two variations in blues music. One of them is typified by the song "Trouble in Mind." Trouble in mind, I'm blue, but I won't be blue always, because the sun gonna shine again in my back door someday. So you, <laughs> you keep that in your spirit and you keep that's drumming right. forward. Keep, keep but there's a, there's a newer variation, and I found a song that I think particularly pertains to one of our panelists. <laughs> And it goes like this, and I love you, dear, but just how long can I keep singing that same old song? <laughs> and I love you, dear, but just how long can I keep singing that same old song? I'm going back to Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all.